Hello and welcome to CDA Oasis. Once again, I welcome Dr. Paul Bilziki from Toronto. He continues to share uh, his clinical cases with us in the series of mentorship uh, posts that he agreed to do for Oasis uh, discussions. Dr. Bilziki, thank you for taking the time to speak with us again today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, so in a, in a few words, if you can give us an idea about what the presentation is going to be about. Uh, this is about uh, restorations in the anterior segment, designing a smile. And it's just an overview of some of the thought processes that I go through when I'm handling uh, an anterior case. It, this format of just 20, 30 minutes, it's not a detailed, accurate how-to, but more of an overview, give you a flavor of what goes through my mind in the restoration of some unique cases. And I hope it just provides some insight for the practitioners out there when they encounter just something out of the ordinary. Um, the previous cases were very successful in terms of page views. So when I go in the back end and I look at the analytics uh, and the data, they've been viewed quite a few times in the thousands of, of times. Um, do you have any other call to action to dentists? Do you, would you like them to provide you with feedback? Um, anything that comes to your mind? Well, in our discussions, I just don't want this to be a waste of anybody's time. And talking or making a presentation, sitting in this private office all alone, it's difficult to know, am I hitting a chord or not hitting a chord? So if they could somehow uh, get you some information, like, don't like, um, back to Oasis would be great. Just so we know, is this of value to anybody? Perfect. So shall we go and see the presentation? Wonderful. Let's go. Uh, continuing with the series on uh, mentorship, if you will, uh, this is this title of this presentation is Designing a Smile. Again, staying with the theme old school. And by this, I mean just uh, I will recapitulate how I've addressed the anterior segment using some unique cases. This isn't meant as a teaching guide to follow everything I'm saying because in 20 or 30 minutes, you can't go over every detail. So it's just to go over some interesting cases that might help you in a case you see sometime in the future that looks similar. So the key points here are anal is, uh, analyzing the case and formulating a vision. And the way I do it is that I grind all my temporaries um, by hand me personally, an auxiliary doesn't do it. And in doing so, I've gotten pretty good at knowing what teeth are supposed to look like. And then communicating that vision to the patient to achieve some form of consensus and give them confidence before the case is completed. Then there's testing and refining that vision with provisionals, making sure that the provisionals replicate the final result. And I think that's very, very important and communicating with the lab to replicate whatever vision you've produced. And then the, there's the importance of attention to detail in every aspect of dentistry. And finally, appreciating the art of dentistry because fashioning new teeth, fashioning a new smile for somebody, using that palette of the front lips, that's, that's an art form. Now, designing a smile, what are the, the determinants of a successful restoration or, or managing a successful smile? And if there's lots of landmarks present, then that makes it pretty easy. And here we're, I have to restore this central that's fractured, and that's the final result. Now, I know there are formulae and relational mathematics that tell you what the shape should be, et cetera. And I remember learning that at dental school and dental anatomy, but trust me, I forgot them as soon as I left the class and I've never used those. It's, it's an art. So first and foremost, obviously, it's matching color and shape with surrounding teeth. And it's fooling the eye that nothing was done, that this was, this was done by mother nature. And even with a simple central, there still can be issues. And in this case, you can see the ladder, the uh, central was out towards the buckle a little bit. There was a prominent buckle, a uh, mesial line angle. It was crowded. The lateral was in lingual version. 
So trying to just take that and park that back into the arch would result in a tooth that was too narrow. So this was the final result or the final anatomy that the lab gave me back. Now I'll tell you, they didn't come up with this. I did. This uh, acrylic provisional, I had to dig this out. This was 10 years in a box, so it's a little bit stained and a little rattier looking because of its aging process. But I, I know that I sat there and I, I tried to curve this corner in. And in doing so, I saw the lateral was too short on the distal or too uh, narrow on the distal. I had to widen that out. And this was given this impression of, uh, of the provisional was given to the lab and they, they made the same thing. So as I said, I personally fabricate all the provisionals and I use methyl methacrylate in a straight hand piece with a Moore sandpaper disc. And I spend a bit of time doing this. And in doing so, you ingrain the knowledge into the self of what the anatomy should be. And I don't want anybody else's decisions on what it should be because as the dentist, it's my opinion that I've got to be in control of everything. So we fiddle with it, define our margins, and then there's the final result. Now I know if I had to do this a second time, maybe the shapes would be a little bit different, but the determinants of what would be aesthetically pleasing, you put this in the patient's mouth and then you just stand back and you look at it. Does it fool your eye? Is it aesthetically pleasing? And these are decisions that you make over the course of a career with experience. So my first anterior case back in 1983, again, the task is simplified if many landmarks are present. So here I have a central, here I've got a cuspid, and that lateral just grew like that his entire life. He, he said it didn't migrate out, this isn't a periodontal case. And this gentleman um, at the time was in his 50s, so he's a product of that era with no fluoride. And so there's a lot of restorative dentistry. The aesthetic demands were not as stringent as they are today. So it was just a matter of taking an impression. And I do this pretty much today as well. And I would just study that impression. I knocked off the lateral, moved it back, and then took an omnivac or a, a, um, a sheet of plastic and vacuformed it. And that helped me make the temporaries. Here that tooth was extracted, um, the teeth were prepared. This is after the site is healed. That's the final bridge. And we did, we went a long way to matching the native central. And that's the case as it was in 1983. And here it is 30 years later. So the other demand I have, it's not only has to look aesthetically pleasing, and here you can see I've, I've redone a lot of the bridge work over the years. But it also has to be durable and withstand the test of time because the prettiest smile is no good in a patient if it doesn't last. Very rarely will patients come back and complain the color, well, it, it wasn't that great. But if it breaks or if it dislodges in a short period of time, they'll come back and complain. Now, here's a 70-year-old female and she's considering a nicer smile. I, ne I didn't set out and say, look, your teeth are worn or anything like that. My practice doesn't run like that. Um, I don't like giving people a problem they did not perceive that they had. But how this started was her incisors, and, uh, or rather the, um, the front anterior segments, been restored over the years with composite resin fillings. Uh, she, I did not do these. She came to me like this. And... She cracked or broke one of these teeth and it was bothering her rough to her tongue. And I said, fine, we'll do two crowns. And so I prepared those two teeth and I made the provisionals. And she went away and came back within a few days and said, boy, I really like the way these provisionals look. The, the rest of my front teeth all of a sudden don't look so good. And I said, well, I, I kind of knew that, but it's, it's wear and tear that's commensurate with your age. So if it doesn't bother you, it certainly doesn't bother me. And she said, well, it is starting to bother me. Can we do something? 
And I said, yes, we can. We can go ahead and place crowns right across the front. Is that something you would want to do? And she said, yes. But, and she, English was a second language for her. So the, these were her words to me. I use my face a lot and I'm very aware of my mouth. And as she was doing this, I could see her rubbing her lip over her teeth and licking them. And I said, I'm afraid of how it might feel and if I can adapt. So the flags go up. Here's somebody who's telling me they have a very high sensory acuity. So I know I need to maintain control of all the parameters. I can't let this one get away from me. So a pre-op model was taken. I'm still, I pour up models here in the office. We grind them. We have everything here to do that. Because this model is sacrosanct. This has to be stored. In case there's a problem, I have to know what is my starting point. If something goes wrong, um, the dimensions are not right, I've got to know where I started. So this is how I typically handle these sorts of cases. I need to create new landmarks. So what I'll do is take some blue block out material, light cured, and just, doesn't take long, just layer some onto, the, onto that, uh, those two teeth. I'm trying to figure out, well, what has she lost? What do I have to replace that wear and tear has taken away? And this is what I've come up with. I don't spend much time doing this because I know that when I make these acrylic temporaries, I'm going to spend a lot of time freehand just playing with those shapes. So I just rough it out. Uh, a vacuum form stent was made. I've prepared the left side. Here's that stent. I hope you can, it's resolvable on your computer screen. And I make the temporaries to what I think is correct. And then I stand back, I give the patient a mirror, and I say, okay, this is my vision. This is what I see. Please note that I'm making the teeth bigger, but just by a little bit, just by about a millimeter or so, just so you know. Because often if, um, if you just do everything, and even if you've increased it by a little bit, they've lived with an image of themselves for a lifetime. And every in some people, the smallest little changes are noticeable and difficult to adapt to. So here is, as I said earlier, trying to form a consensus. This is what I envision. This is how I see your smile. What do you think? Give me some feedback. And invariably, they'll look at it and hum and ha, and they're not sure because she's been sitting for two, three hours in my chair doing this. And she said, well, okay, keep going for it. And because, and I tell them, if I can please my eye first, because I've done this, if I can please my eye first, then I know pleasing the patient is easy. So to assure her, I'm not making her look like Bucky Beaver. She will look, it will look within the realm of what is normal. And then go ahead, this is all at the same appointment. Take another impression, there's the stone model. And now I will rebuild these two teeth using the same method with blue block out material. Draw a sheet of plastic over that and then prepare the contralateral side. So I've made these temps to a firm landmark. That was my guide. And now I can make these to the to the provisionals. And in this way, I know that I'm managing all dimensions with a high degree of certitude. And there are the finished provisionals. Now she spent five hours in my chair, four or five hours. So yes, the tissue's a little bit red, but that's because of retraction cord and picking away cement. Now that impression is secured and this is sent to the lab. And with instructions, make same. Don't be too inventive. This is what the patients agreed upon. I've told her to go home. You may like it. I may like it. Make sure your family's online with it, your friends. If there's any concerns, come back and we'll change it because this is methyl methacrylate. It chemically binds to itself. I can add and subtract at will. And I've done this in the past where they, they thought it was too long. We made it shorter. Then they came back. I want it longer again. Okay, let's try it out. So you can do this with methyl methacrylate. I don't know if you can do it with composite resin. And several impressions were taken, some of which where I would prepare the teeth 
like this is the left side. So this impression was of the prepared teeth with those teeth unrestored. So the lab has many landmarks that they can use where they work up their case. And in this side, I think I left the provisionals in place and then took an impression of the right side. The crowns, uh, these are the provisionals when she came back and you can see that the tissues healed up very nicely. And now what I'll do is I will put the final crowns and these are in the biscuit bake against the temporaries. So I can check, did the lab follow my instructions? Like how close were they to making what I wanted. And I could see here the teeth were just a little bit shorter and perhaps a little bit square, but in this way, I can analyze it. And so can the patient, she's given a mirror. These are the provisionals we've agreed to. Here's the final, do you think we're close? Not close, and the feedback goes back and forth and adjustments are made as required. And I can look at it from this aspect as well. Where did they put the incisal edge? Because I've had situations where the length was good, but this may have been warped either to the buckle or to the lingual. It's happened. And uh, I have very close working relationships with my lab, uh, but they can have an off day. And then the temps were removed on the left side and the, the final crowns put in. And there were some issues with disparities and then size alleged length and things of that sort. So now I will take a pickup impression. And what I've done is I'm, or what I'm doing is securing the crowns with a little bit of impression material. And then, and so they're secure and won't move and then just take a pickup impression. I've sectioned some dies from a model and just park those into each crown, pour that up and generate a stone model, which I know is, is accurately fitting. And this goes off to the lab uh, with all the photos I've taken and some notes which I can make on the pictures and say, make these changes. And they come back from the lab, beautifully glazed, all dolled up. And I'm often fond of saying, pretty porcelain. Like this whole thing about aesthetic dentistry, even the phrase really bothers me. And this is just good dentistry. And um, pretty porcelain is the easiest part. The hardest part is making sure that the dimensions are right, that it is harmonious with the patient's physiology and their, their habits, how they move their mouth around and chew. There it is from the lingual. They went a little whole hog and put some staining in there. Whoop-de-doo. Now it comes down to inserting these crowns because at any time you can make an error. So with a large batch of crowns, my habit is to insert alternating crowns and cement them in permanently, and then try in the intervening crowns because you can get hung up. L doing this by hand, the overlay porcelain, the lab may not get it right, and I will tell you about 100% of the time they don't. And I'm glad that they don't because there's always a little bit of tightness. If it's, if it's loose, if, they, if the patient say, says to me, it doesn't feel tight, that usually means they're a little bit too slack and I'm worried about open contacts. So I don't mind using a little bit of articulating paper, picking up those high marks where it's interfering, and then smoothing those off, removing them little by little until the crown just goes to place with just a hint of resistance. So I know that I'm there and that they won't have open contacts and pack food. And there's the case that's finalized. So by this method, bereft of computers, I've managed to orchestrate a smile, which I know is harmonious and the patient's happy. Before I cemented this in, I knew what the shapes were going to be rather than opening up a box full of crowns and saying, oh, this is what they gave me. So as I've said in a previous post, I usually make these treatment totem poles for the patient. And so I can say, this is how we started. We did the analysis and the vision. We made that vision a reality. You test drove it, you wore it for a few weeks, and then the lab replicated what we designed. So everybody is happy and there's no surprises. Now, 
The importance of good provisionals, where they can test drive what you've created. The importance increases as the number of landmarks decrease. And this is a, a female in her 30s, and she came in and she says, everybody in my family has large diastema. No, she used spaces, obviously. I hate my teeth and I never smile. And she, as she was telling me this, I could see she kept her teeth, and these teeth were very prominent. And she had to work hard to drape her lip over the teeth when she spoke. And, and would hold her hand almost over her mouth, and she hated the way her teeth looked. So now I need to make a vision concrete that everybody can assess before we know where we're going, before I can give this. I don't even know where I'm going to go with this. And you can see on the radiograph, people have made attempts. They've plopped some composite resin on those centrals to try to close the space a little bit. And you can see the staining there, obviously. So this isn't decay or a crack. And I assume that that lateral, it was congenitally missing. And I just like, where do I go with this? So I uh, got my models and I said, all right, uh, can you live with a, lit, with a, a little space, with a small space? And she said, yes. So I said, all right. Uh, I worked up a case where I just used some material here and tried to make these teeth a bit wider, close the space down, and add a, a lateral. The person was not a wealthy person, so we're trying to do as few crowns as possible. And as I was doing this, something inside me says, this is not right. This, this isn't going to work. But I did it, and I was so conscious of how bad it looked, it looked like two headlights on a large Buick coming towards you, that I just said, I, I, I can't go with this. Let's try something else. And I, unfortunately, I didn't take photographs of how that, those provisionals look. So I did this. I took a central Pontic and I parked it right in the midline because here the relational dimensions between the upper teeth and the lower teeth we don't have these two large centrals, but of course now we've got a midline issue and a big one. Uh, here we have a little whoop de doo in that, in that outline because the labial frenum is coming through there. I gave her a mirror and when she looked at this man, I, I wish I could show you her eyes because the emotions expressed in her eyes is far more than the smile. But she was happy. And even though there's a midline, there's a tooth parked right in the midline. So it's faking, we're trying to fake out the eye that everything looks more normal. At a later appointment, we had to address that labial frenum by excising it. Tissue grew back quite nicely. And there you can see the progression. There's the final case. Now you can argue, well, the it's a little bit too light. It's a little bit too uniform with color. I'm hypercritical as well when I look at these photographs. But when it's parked in her mouth and she smiles, she was one happy lady. So again, it's an accommodation. I understand it's not perfect. I happen to have a practice. Nobody wants to go to an orthodontist. I beg them, please, it will make life easier. We'll get a more ideal outcome. But a lot of folks just don't want to spend a year or two in, in brackets. And a lot of people don't have that kind of money where they want to go to that expense. So now she complains that in family photos, she's the only one without a space. And that everybody comments on that, which is kind of neat. We have a good laugh about it. And there it is some 10 years later, and it's still functioning, and everybody's happy. Now this, what has really saved uh, or has made restorations in the anterior as successful as they are is the materials that we use now. That other case that I just showed you was porcelain fused to metal because I had large pontic spaces and I needed the strength. So porcelain fused to metal in my mind was the way to go. But in this case, this was my first case with zirconia back in 2005, 2006. I can't remember. Exactly. But this patient has the right number of teeth, but they're just spaced and there's just too much space and not enough tooth material. And she's been with me since 1980. 
And as she was getting older, this was starting to bother her more and more. I said, look, uh, I can make PFM restorations here. They just won't look that great. And why don't you go for orthodontics again and could well afford it. Kids went for ortho, no problems. She just did not want orthodontics. So with the advent of zirconia, I said, let's give this a try. So again, we've got some landmarks, but we have to rearrange the spacing. You can see it here. So what I did was prepare these teeth to, as retainers for either bridge work or crowns, and then took my acrylic, my sandpaper disc, and basically just played with it, uh, trying to squeeze in a pontic here and here. So she has far too many incisors, but, and there's the provisional that was sent off to the lab. Case came back. Yes, there were still dimensions that were hard to breach. I could have put a crown here, but elected not to. Thought I'd just widen out the cuspid. And that case was cemented in. Here it is in 2004. That little bit of bleeding was just a result of nicking the tissue, trying to get some cement off. And here it is some five or four years later, 2008. 2017, and it's held up quite nicely. And it's just the ability to fool the eye into thinking that this is what Mother Nature gave her. And again, zirconia. Strength and aesthetics, just a wonderful material. Patient came in. I've got a family wedding coming up in three or four months. I want nice teeth. My son's getting married. Everybody in the family had ortho. I don't want to go for ortho. I want a nice smile. So again, There's the radiographs. People have put composite resin in certain areas. This lateral, half of that is composite resin. So they both look the same once the resin was stripped off. Again, stone models, very important to do your analysis before the patient is in your chair. I sit with these. They replicate what the patient looks like. I can best diagnose occlusals, um, issues and here you can see she has a very very deep bite uh, but she almost did not hit her anteriors you can't see this in the mouth all that well you try to get a mirror try to visualize this but on stone models you can see it it's apparent what i'm up against so before the patient is in the chair i'm already imaging in my mind what tooth preparation I need, what materials I can use, can I remove enough for porcelain fused to metal? Or will it, if I do that, I can use a metal, a very, very thin metal substrate, um, or just the metal exposed without porcelain here. But she wanted it to look spectacular, so I knew I was going to go with zirconia. And I would leave these lingual surfaces in the in the uh, core material, the zirconia would be exposed, so I could leave it thin, yet have strength. And these are things you work out in your mind before you touch a tooth. And you can see here, she did impinge on soft tissue, but it, she wasn't aware of it, never bothered her. I ever said, did you ever notice about a sore palate? No, never. Stone model, applying that blockout material. I didn't have to be too particular on how I splash this on because I knew I work this out while I'm grinding it in my hand. And another caveat was I don't want my centrals touched. Basically what's bothering me are the spaces between these two teeth. I told her that was a bad idea, but we'll try to do it your way. And I prepared the lateral and the cuspid on both sides. Yes, I noticed the tissue was rolled and injured here as a result of tooth preparation because there was a bit of a root proximity problem here. But I could tell from the radiograph that there was room. I do periodontal surgery in my office. We could have done some periodontal surgery, a bit of crown lengthening. But timing, I mean, it's not a perfect world. My son's getting married in three, four months, make me nice teeth to do elective surgery, you would have to wait three, four months just for the tissue to reorganize after healing to see where you could place a margin. 
So I'm prepared to go with the flow. You have to be flexible with people. So I made this design and said, okay, try this and go away, knowing I would get the phone call. I want my front teeth involved. And I got that phone call. So here she came back. And you can see that tissue has resolved. And even this rolled area uh, looks a, a quite a bit better. And it could have been just packing periodontal cord in the adjacent teeth and taking a, an air rotor through there was the periodontal surgery she required. So the stone model was taken. May, I want to bring these teeth out more labially. There you can see the on the back shell. Now I know uh, there's techniques where you take a VPS impression and then you fill it with something and then put reseat the VPS impression. Um, I don't know how you do that effectively because you can't see. Once you've got the impression in their mouth with the material waiting, it, waiting for it to set, I just I don't know how you can reseat these and see what you're doing. But here with these shells, I can see, do I have enough reduction? If I'm lengthening or, or moving the labial aspect more forwards, then I don't have to take away as much, as much tooth structure. And this stent will let me know if I'm in the ballpark. So the provisionals were, were made. And these, this is just the lab process of making the zirconia crowns. And we use a lot of photographs as communications between my lab and myself. And I can easily make these notes of what I want, uh, try to tell him uh, the concerns I have. So yes, computers are neat. And the case came back after a few weeks and the tissues firmed and tightened up. These are the provisionals. And I'll tell you that those margins fit perfectly. Embrasures are all designed, they fit perfectly. They have to, or you're not going to manage this tissue effectively. And when they come back and you pull it off and it's bleeding, then it's a nightmare to cement effectively. So using the technique I always use, I just snap the temps in half because I know I can reattach them with methyl methacrylate at the end of the appointment. And I put the temporaries in, or sorry, the, the final crowns in, in the try-in and see I've got, it's not what I wanted. It's not what I wanted. So take a picture, add this little note, need to lengthen and increase the buckle profile to match the temporaries. Please replicate what I have designed. And uh, my lab and I, we have a love-hate relationship, but so it goes. Again, another pickup impression. So the lab can see they'll have the parameters of, of the temporaries against what they've made. And there are other little nuances that need to be addressed. This looks too much like one piece. It has to be deepened. And the design here was to go with a two unit splint on the cuspid lateral because increasing the dimensions here, I wasn't sure what stress I, was, I would put on those peg laterals and I would worry about rotation and dislodgement of the crown at, after a certain time. So I thought if I can splint these two together, I won't have to worry about teeth moving. It'll be secure. I won't have to worry about teeth dislodging. And sometimes when you have these small laterals and you prepare them like that, you weaken them. And over the course of a career, I have had crowns that have snapped off. I don't like to see that. So I would rather go for strength and sacrifice the aesthetic demands. So I asked for a bit more facial bulk to help make it look like separate teeth. And I take a picture of my provisionals and say, look, this is, you've got to open that up a little bit. So the, this is a neat way of communicating what you want. And all this material is sent off to the lab. And that over impression, these are the, the impression of the provisionals. And they've matched exactly the design that, that I've worked out. All six crowns, or the retain, these are two unit splints, two unit splints. And again, it's fooling the eye that this case, all the teeth are separate. So that's how we started. So proceeding from start to finish with confidence and vision comes with experience. You have to leave time to fiddle. You just don't come out of dental school and you're carving this straight away. 
you have to take a lot of time, get it right, get it wrong, get it right, get it wrong. And I spend an inordinate amount of time doing the provisional phase. It, my old professor, Dr. Blake McAdam, used to say provisionals is not a slapdash affair done at the end of the appointment. It's probably as important as every other phase. And I've heard other dentists say, well, don't make it look too good because then they won't want the final ones. It's the exact opposite. You have to make it look as good or better so you can guide the whole process. So again, creating the illusion that nothing was done, that Mother Nature had parked these crowns here. So in conclusion, again, this little totem pole, treatment totem pole was made for the patient. So it's case analysis and formulating a vision. Communicating that vision to the patient to achieve consensus and confidence before you go to completion. The last, where you don't want to do this is once you've got it in and it's not right and then try to talk them into it. It's testing and refining a vision with provisionals, communicating with the lab to replicate your vision. And they won't get it right all the time. So you have to be on top of everything. The importance of attention to detail in every aspect of dentistry and appreciating the art of dentistry and practicing it with passion and a commitment to excellence. And I must say, after 38 years, I'm thrilled when I get a result like this. So I thank you for listening.